Our next speaker is a professor of electrical and medical engineering at Caltech. She's interested particularly in neural sensing, but also in neural stimulation. Get ready for some serious science. Please join me in welcoming to the Hackaday Supercon stage, Azita Imami. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so, as Paul mentioned, I'm a professor of electrical engineering and medical engineering at Caltech. I have been at Caltech for over 17 years now. And um, these days we are working on highly miniaturized wireless biomedical devices for a variety of applications. Uh, some of these devices are implantable, some of them are wearable. We try to make them completely wireless, very, very small and low cost by using standard CMOS technologies. So I have a few examples here. This is, for instance, a tiny CMOS chip that is also a glucose sensor and can be injected under the skin. It doesn't have a battery, it doesn't have any external component. Everything is integrated, so this is an antenna on top of the chip using the existing metal layers, and these are the electrodes for biochemical measurements. Um, so the chip, uh, through an external reader, uh, such as this one, uh, we power it up using RF signal and using this on-chip antenna, and we communicate through backscattering and it consumes only five microwatts when it turns on and measures the glucose level, digitizes it, and sends the data out. So this is another example. We are overall interested in, um, as I mentioned, implantable, ingestible also devices. This is a smart pill that uh, when it goes through the GI tract, we can precisely locate it inside the body, know exactly where it is, and how fast it's moving through the GI tract and communicate with it. But we also have worked on neural interfaces, which is the main topic of my talk today. Um, as I will discuss, power consumption is extremely important for this kind of medical devices. We want to make them extremely energy efficient to um, avoid having batteries. So we have worked on energy harvesting, as I mentioned, through RF wireless but also using uh, the body fluid itself, whether the blood or interstitial fluid or sweat to power up these devices. So we have built also biofuel cell energy harvesting for biomedical applications. But as I mentioned today, I want to talk to you about our research related to neural interfaces. Neural interfaces have been around for quite some time, and some of them are actually extremely successful uh, and have changed uh, impact, uh, the life of many patients. For instance, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. I started in this domain uh, by working on epilepsy. Uh, because there are a large amount of data available in open sources for epileptic patients who go through surgery, so they record a lot of neural activity for these, uh, for these patients. So our first project was to predict seizure from the neural data before the symptoms arrive so that the, we can alert the patient or perform deep brain stimulation to stop the seizure. So from that project, uh, I started working uh, with uh, Professor Richard Anderson at Caltech, who is a neuroscientist and works with tetraplegic patients. Um, let me move forward. So this is Eric, uh, one of the very first patients um, that uh, at Caltech got the uh, implants of electrodes. These are micro needles type electrodes that penetrate into the cortex 
and they are invasive, but they can pick up new single neuron activity. So as you can, the idea, as you can see, the idea is here is to pick the neural data. And for Eric, who was, um, who had a spinal cord injury and completely couldn't move any of his limbs, tetraplegic patient, to, from the neural data to predict um, kinematics, whether he wants to move his hand up or down or to the left or to the right. Uh, but as you can see, this is very cumbersome. Uh, so we have to connect an amplifier to the electrodes through a wire, goes to a big box that does filtering digitization, and then it goes to a computer to perform the decoding of the kinematic. Our goal in my lab, being in integrated circuits and systems, is trying to miniaturize everything on a single tiny chip so that one day patients can wear this um, in normal uh, settings rather than only in the clinic. But it's still, this is remarkable. I want to show you this video of Eric, who by thinking is moving a robotic arm and um, basically follows, this robotic arm follows the, uh, let me see if the video works. Yes, follows this red cursor on the screen. So one of, actually there is another video that I don't have today, but Eric, one of the dreams that Eric had was to be able to bring a can of beer uh, to, his, uh, to his mouth and be able to drink, and there is another video that he does it and he's so happy. Uh, so, but as you can see, this is only possible right now in a clinic or in a, in a lab setting. And our goal is to improve this, um, this system. And also um, make it more robust, faster, and more energy efficient. So just to give you an idea, these are the electrodes. They're still very small. Each electrode array has about 100 needle type electrodes. Uh, that penetrate into the cortex. My colleague who is a neuroscientist has done a lot of research where to put these electrodes, places that the intention starts to going also to motor cortex and other uh, places in the brain. So the way that we usually evaluate our neural interface system is that we ask a patient by thinking to move a cursor from this middle point to a random point on this circle that turns lights up. And by thinking, we ask them to move the cursor to one of these points. And we call this center out task. So if you look at the um, architecture of brain machine interfaces, one of the things that you quickly notice is that the data is so noisy. It actually looks like noise, very low amplitude, extremely difficult to work with, with a lot of artifacts. So there requires a lot of signal processing. So if you look at this chain after signal processing and filtering, there is a unit of feature extraction. Feature extraction basically converts these electrical signals to information, to features that carry the most amount of information. Then we send it to a classifier or a decoder to then tell us whether the patient wants to move the cursor up or down and which, with what velocity. And then this is a complex uh, a control system, as you can imagine, because there is also visual feedback, the plasticity of the brain, and it takes some time actually for the patient to learn to control things with the brain. So in my group, uh, we've been trying to solve these challenges that are associated with this very noisy data. Um, such as non-stationary conditions. One of the things that you quickly notice when you work with neural data is that there's so much variations day to day because brain is not a solid environment. These micro needles are moving, they're, they're micro movements. And one minute we might be picking, we might be listening to one neuron and another day or another 10 minutes later, we might be listening to another neuron. So there are a lot of non-stationary effects. There is a latency in the loop, and there is a lot of hardware complexity that needs to, it makes it very hard to integrate everything in a single chip. 
So let's first uh, think about feature extraction unit and think about what it means in terms of neural interfaces to generate features that carry the most amount of information. So this is historically the way that feature engineering has worked in neural interfaces because we know that neurons get activated and they create spikes. So spike detection has been the traditional way for neural interfaces. Um, so as I mentioned, these electrodes are listening, for instance, to two neurons that are the closest and create these kind of signals that we need to detect. So it, so we, through signal processing, we can actually separate these two neurons because they have a slightly different signature. So we can do feature extraction through uh, spike detection. And then you set a threshold and you say, if this threshold, if the data, if the signal passes a certain threshold, I have a spike. And that's called threshold crossing. And basically we take normally, the traditional way is that you take a 30 millisecond or 50 millisecond beam of time and you count how many spikes you have. When a neuron gets activated, you get a lot of firing. And then you get maybe 20 activation, 20 spikes per this beam. And that number has been used as a feature that can be sent to a decoder to decode information. So as you can see, it's very simple and very intuitive, but at the same time, it carries a lot of problems because as I mentioned, we are trying to only listen to the neurons that are closest to this electrode. But what something happens over time. So for instance, this is an array in the motor cortex of a patient, and this is early, right after the surgery and putting in the array. And then within two, three years, you see that the signal degrades and almost disappears. You still have some signal, but doesn't look like spike anymore. And the main reason for that is that the electrodes degrade, the neurons actually try to get away from the electrodes because they see it as a foreign um, uh, object in the body. But we don't, it's very bad if we, in, this is a very in, invasive surgery, when we put the electrodes in, we want them to last for many, many years. So this kind of problems um, motivated us to try to do better than just a spike sorting and threshold crossing. And this motivates us the fact that basically you, at any amount of time, and also, as I mentioned, we are very sensitive to the movement of the needles in the brain. But imagine if instead of just listening to these neurons that are closest, I also listen to the neighbors and also listen to the whole background and combine all that information to extract features. So this way I, uh, I rely less and less on single individual neurons. Instead, I also listen to the neighbors. So the way that we, um, we try to do that is through broadband, let me see. Yes, so instead of just looking at the spikes, we look at the broadband data and we try to extract information from the broadband data that we have already access to. So there are a lot of, uh, so let me skip this. So let me, and then um, this motivated us also to, be, to try to find a way of feature extraction that provides the most amount of information and also it's, um, it doesn't, it automatic basically, it, we don't need to change it for every patient, we don't need to adapt it all the time. So we try to do that through a neural network based feature extraction technique. So the way that we do it is very similar to a convolutional neural network that are, that are used, for instance, for image processing or uh, for um, image recognition or, la or speech recognition. So we created this 1D convolutional neural networks that, auto that we can train on a lot of previous data that we had collected and then generate the most informative feature for the patients. So this is basically the details of it. I'm not gonna go through all the details. Um, our paper just got accepted to Nature by Medical Engineering, so it will be out um, in 
in a month or so. And we also ha we, we have released also the code for it, which will be open source and people in the, in the area, in the field of neuroscience and neural interfaces can use it. But I want to show you what kind of difference this has made for our patients. So this is, uh, this is the central task. This is a double blind experiment, meaning that the patient and the clinician, they don't know what algorithm has been used. One of them is the traditional threshold crossing, and the other is our automatic um, neural network based uh, feature engineering technique, which we call it FINET. And this is James. James was so frustrated with the neural interface uh, that he had with the electrodes that it wouldn't work anymore that well. So he wanted to be explanted. He wanted the electrodes to be removed after three years. But you will see uh, what kind of difference our algorithm has made. So James is trying to move. So as you can see, this works better? pretty well. Is it be better or worse than last week? This is better. So as you can see, he can quickly move the cursor by thinking this is without any assist, random, and this is not decoder A. I'm sure you know which one is ours and which one is the old one. So A is the old technique and B is the new technique that I showed you. So if you overlay all of these movements, it shows how much improvement we have received. So this is the trajectory of the movement of cursor using threshold crossing. And this is our technique using um, neural networks that have been trained for patients. The amazing thing about this technique is that we trained it on one patient and without touching any, the, any of the weights of our neural network, we tested on other patients and it worked perfectly fine. So we, and then we also trained on one region of the brain and tested in another region of the brain and it still worked very well. So this showed to us that this is generalizable and extracts, it's something inherent in the neural data that we are extracting. So this is extremely promising right now. James actually decided to keep the implant, and these days he's using our technique, Finet, to play video games, and even uh, we have a joint project with a company that is a driving company, and he's driving a car by thinking. So it's been an amazing experience working with actual human participants, participants and seeing the, the impact uh, on their lives. So now our um, I have to mention that we have recently uh, created a hardware, a CMOS integrated circuit version of Finet and being tested, and soon we will be testing the chip. In, this was still on the computer, running on the computer, and now we have a chip version of it that uh, will be used by patients. So let me see how much time I have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, so we also have worked on the decoder. I don't have much time to.